Sarah and I uh, wanted to open, first of all, by thanking everyone and by pointing out how excited we are to see this community come together again and again. We haven't exhausted people from travel just yet. Um, and um, this is a very different meeting for us. All the previous meetings were essentially planning meetings. We talked about what we will do. And what we wanted to focus, not just our own talk in the beginning, but really as foreshadowing the entire opening session, these are going all to be talks about what has been already going on. There are going to be real results in real biology that is being, uh, that is being learned, in real teams that are coming together internationally across sometimes 10 or more groups to take on these problems and build the atlas. And so that's a very exciting moment, I think, for the entire community. And that's going to be the main focus of what we will present to you today. In our typical tradition, we always flip the order. So I'm going to start this time, and Sarah's going to take the second part of the talk. And it's really a foreshadowing kind of talk. Mostly, we don't want to steal the thunder from everyone who's going to talk right after us, but we stole a lot of their slides. And so to remind you what, we're, what our quest is about, we want to build ourselves something similar to a, peri a periodic table of all of the cells. We want to know what we're made of. And um, our mission is to create this as a comprehensive ma reference map, not just of the types, but also of the molecular properties of all human cells, because human cells are our fundamental unit. And we hope that this would become a basis for better understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating um, disease in the context of health. So the human cell atlas is about health, but without understanding health, it is impossible to understand and to treat disease. And so this is our timeline. Last time we all met was in October. We were in Rehovot. People had pool parties at the time. It's a little different here right now, but we actually got gorgeous weather. This is our general meeting. And in between October and now, we are in the data collection phase already, which we believe will be ongoing for years. Um, but we are starting to see the glimpses of what this data is like. Um, I want to point out that in April, there's going to be sort of a pre-release on a pre-data coordination platform, a little bit on, uh, more on this um, a little further in this talk. And in October, we will all convene again. This time, it's going to be cool again. It's going to be um, right around Halloween, and it will be in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, at the Broad Institute. So um, here's a little bit of a status update on the HCA. We have, from our registry, as of a couple of days ago, people registered from 44 countries, really covering the globe quite well, 482 scientists, um, studying 22 tissues across 185 projects. And I'm told by Jane that, in fact, these numbers, which literally were finalized on Monday, are by now outdated. It turns out that a lot of people like to register right before meetings, and so by now we're outdated, but in the best possible sense. And so what have these people been doing? So let's look at a few snapshots. One thing that we've discussed um, last time is the effort to start building a first draft of an immune cell atlas. And in a concerted effort, there has been collection of um, data, some of which will be complete open access and some of which will have data access restrictions for the bone marrow, the cord blood, the peripheral blood, um, all of which will be available in open access, as well as spleen, for which we don't yet have a plot. And these together, just these three together, will exceed 1.6 million cells. All of these cells have been collected, and most of them will be released by April 2nd. Uh, colon, lung, and humanized mouse have come from samples that require controlled access. The data itself will be available, but it will require access controls. And they are a smaller subset of the data, but this is really the first large data set that we can say is entirely HCA. It was collected in a concerted effort. It will be available to the community, and I'll show you a few additional glimpses from it um, a little uh, later on. A few additional efforts have been going on in parallel. Another major effort is around building a map of human development. This is the developmental cell atlas. There is one major effort uh, led by Maz Hanifa, Sarah, my colleague here, and Sam Bajati, all in the UK, who have so far analyzed 250,000 cells from different um, fetal tissues. And there is a concerted and focused effort on the developing brain from Stan Linerson in Sweden and from Arnold Kriegstein in UCSF. Um, the first tranche of 250,000 cells, when they're released, will all be open access. And Maz today will describe a lot of the wonderful things that were learned from these three efforts. We have a major effort 
of more than 10 groups that have come together to collect a tumor cell atlas, and in particular to take on the very nitty-gritty technical challenges that are posed by building a tumor atlas. Um, you first have to circumvent these challenges before you can ask deep biological questions. Um, this is a project that is funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative as part of the pilot project and has the lovely name START. And Orit Rosen will describe to us today some of the initial efforts that the team is taking on and some of the early insights that they have gleaned. Five different sets of groups, each of them made of two groups or three, have taken on the question of the lung and the airways. They take several different strategies, spanning from trying to sample the entire lung and airway system to going deeper in particular subsets. They are all coordinating and talking to each other. Martin, uh, Martin, uh, Nawin, I did my best, um, is going to describe uh, these efforts in more detail in actually one of our opening talks. But you can see that there are efforts that focus on single cell analysis along entire lungs, along the airway and the parenchyme, um, um, with additional types of data that are not based on, gene, on, on uh, single cell RNA-seq, and also around the computational challenges of data integration, both within a data set and across data sets, led by Fabian Theiss's um, lab. Um, this is one, probably, of the tissues that was not even on our radar a year ago. People were maybe saying something with the lung. Now we know that there are great surprises in these tissues. I'll show you, I'll preview one of them. And it is clear that the community has really come together around this organ. And um, last but not least, this is, uh, the human cell atlas is about the human, but in order to pursue many of the findings and in order to relate them to much that is already known in biology, there is also the need to understand better our model organisms. Ido Amit and Nikolaus Serejewski ran in November a workshop focused on the question of model systems. There's also a sister effort in the fly cell atlas that also met in December in 2017. And we've actually seen the first two early atlases focused on the mouse taking a full organism breath, trying to do as many different tissues as possible, maybe not as deep in any given tissue, but to give us a breath first search of the most commonly used mammalian model organism, one of them coming from Zhejiang University and uh, uh, Dana-Farber, and one of them is the Tabula, Mur Tabula Muris Consortium, actually led by Steve Quake, who is one of the organizing committee members of the Human Cell Atlas as well. And uh, encouragingly, they've actually uh, released their, their paper in the bioarchive as a preprint before it was even published. Working together in our community is not just about figuring out the atlases for tissues, but also about taking on shared technical challenges, and in particular about comparing the many different methods that are out there and seeing which of them not just are useful or the best, but are the most appropriate for different types of purposes and how they can be integrated in order to make themselves better. And so one of the beautiful examples of that is the Space TX team that is led by Ed Lane at the Allen uh, Institute, but that involves more than 13 different groups and takes on every possible imaginable method for um, spatial transcriptomics, um, from in situ hybridization to in situ sequencing to many other clever ideas that are out there, and tries to empower them by single cell and single nucleus RNA-seq and computational analysis. This team has taken on the brain as the main tissue in which these tests are being conducted, but the hope is, of course, that the lessons that we learned will be much more broadly applicable. And this is, again, a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative pilot project. There are also efforts to compare the many protocols that are out there for single cell RNA-seq and actually taking two different approaches and coordinating between them. One effort led by Holger Hein is to identify a single pool of samples and then both test them locally but also send them to many other labs around the world for them to apply different kinds of protocols. And this really tests very carefully the possibility not just of which protocol works well in one person's hands, but also how things generalize across different groups. A second project takes the complementary approach, and instead of, running, of, of distributing the testing, is doing the testing in a single location, but tries many different protocols, both full length and massively parallel protocols for cells and for nuclei across five different types of specimens, from cell lines to immune cells, 
to brain tissue to colon tissue. And some of the samples that it uses comes from Holger Heinz's uh, resource. And so the two actually end up being coupled together. And there is a nice Slack channel in our, um, in our HCA Slack, hashtag benchmark, for those that are interested in this. What is critical about protocols is sharing them so that everyone would be able to use those protocols. Um, the HCA has a group in protocols.io. Two of the protocols are already published, meaning they're completed. There are seven additional protocols, three are highlighted here, that are still in development in terms of writing them carefully and clearly, and that for any member in the group are already accessible. And we hope that additional groups will make their protocols available using this format that allows, it's really like a GitHub, but for lab protocols. And of course, all of the data needs to be served, and this is what the data coordination platform is working on it. Their roadmap now involves a pilot launch in the summer of 2018, so stay tuned. The summer will be here before we know it. It is built by UCSC, EBI, Broad, um, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative engineers, and the CZI has already also supported the building of the platform. And in addition to the boxes that we are all familiar with for ingesting, storing, analyzing, and, and analyzing the data, the DCP is also now developing a pretty minimal browser that would ensure that any data coming in can be used by users. DCP team is more than 50 people now. They meet internationally with an impressive, at an impressive pace and have made excellent progress. So I want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek uh, for the sub-atlases, and then Sarah will pick up from there. Um, here's a little sneak vignette, actually, from Sarah's work on the developmental cell atlas. This is an analysis um, of the placenta, and you can look at both the fetal and the maternal cells um, at the same time. And you can find how the maternal cells manage to live together with fetal cells that are expressing paternal antigens, which are basically foreign material for the mother. This is a very important, actually, clinical question in the context of uh, successful pregnancies. And it is also a fascinating immunological puzzle as to how the mother does not reject its own child. A second sneak peek comes from the lung cell atlas. The data shown here is from J. Rajagopal's lab, but there's actually similar findings from other labs, for example, from Alon Klein and Aron Jaffe. And they show that the CFTR gene, the gene for CF, is actually specifically expressed in a very small and rare subpopulation of cells that was not known to exist in the lung at all. These are now called the lung ionocyte. And those cells are not the cells that we were all taught are the cells in which the CF gene is expressed. It's supposed to be expressed in the basal cell, that major cloud over there, but in fact they're actually expressed in that speckle of cells, and that opens up new biological opportunities. I'll show you a little bit more from the immune cell atlas, because that will not actually be featured later on today. This is the peripheral blood from eight different individuals. We have earlier, together with Nira Cohen's lab and with Maz Hanifa shown, that there are different subsets of dendritic cells. That was done kind of the old-fashioned way in single cell analysis. The cells were actually sorted into plates, and that is so like 2014 now. Um, this was done in a massively parallel mode without assuming first where the dendritic cells are, but it basically came back with the same classification, which is one of the robustness criteria, actually, for having found the cell is having found it more than once and using orthogonal approaches. If we look at the bone marrow, foundational work from Dana Peer and Fabian Theis and others have shown that in these kinds of snapshots actually hides the entire process of differentiation. And so to make this a more pleasing thing, we have made a little movie. These are all of the cells from the bone marrow, again, of eight individuals. And this is a force-directed layout embedding of those cells that would let us look at the process of differentiation. We have to let the ball unravel a little bit, and then we can see the stem cells as they lead towards erythropoiesis, the monocyte lineages in several different steps, and then it runs through the development of B cells, I believe in four different steps, up to mature B cells and plasma cells, which you will not see in the bone marrow, and then the CD4 lineage, the CD8 lineage, and the last one that will be highlighted will be the NK cells. There is much more that can be done with this data. This is only to show that it is actually there, and that now all the bright minds in our community would be able to analyze it and make, um, hopefully, exciting biological findings. And finally, I'll show you a little bit from the cord blood, because we were in for a surprise. Again, these are eight individuals. In this case, the individuals are newborns. If you look at peripheral blood, this is one individual. I look at the second, the third, all eight individuals basically give you the same type of plot and have very similar cellular compositions. That's not the case in the cord blood. This is the second individual, the third. 
and so on, they have radically different cellular compositions. It's actually not such a radical surprise for hematologists. They do know that things are kind of finicky in the cord blood. We were concerned, concerned. We ran another four individuals for the cord blood from a completely different collection source, and we got the same level of variation there as well, suggesting that this is a much more variable resource, either because of how it's collected or because of the differences in the maturity of the immune system. So more, again, to be discovered there. Our goal in this case was not just to make the discoveries. It was to make good data that would be available to the world to make its own discoveries. And this is really the only acknowledgement slide that we'll show. And we're showing it in order to highlight the fact that all of these people that span postdocs and grad students and staff scientists, actually from many different labs, have agreed to collect this data in this mode, where instead of analyzing it and writing their paper, they're collecting it, checking it for QCs, putting it out there, and then turning around and doing whatever they are interested in doing with it. And we really hope that this would be a model for our community. And we're hearing now about more and more open access data sets of this sort. And so this data will be served starting on April 2 at this lovely URL generated for us by the data coordination platform, which we're not planning to do this, but have volunteered to do this, and we're very grateful for it. And it would include not just the cord blood and bone marrow, but additional tissues that are the first to release. And I want to emphasize that this has actually taken us longer than we anticipated, not because the science took longer, but because compliance took longer. Turns out that compliance is more complicated than one might have anticipated, and we will have a whole breakout session about it in order to use this and additional lessons that were learned from running through this exercise, including how to start with consent and how to end with release. And so in, with this, I will end this part, and I'm going to turn to Sarah, who's going to give us a quick snapshot into our HCA community. Thank you. And So thanks to Aviv for the overview of this very exciting point in time where we're here now 18 months after our first meeting and we're seeing all these fantastic data generation um, and, and um, uh, really a fiesta of science into human tissues. And, and the most gratifying thing is basically that, that a lot of these are community efforts that are taking place across institutes, across countries and the wonderful people who are leading and participating in these efforts are going to be presenting later today and, and tomorrow. And, um, and thank every, I also want to just quickly say thanks to everybody who's, who's been so enthusiastic and has signed up so quickly to come and fill this lecture theater to the hilt. Um, so really, I just want to end by summarizing again that we have here just, you know, this is only about um, 18 months after we first met in, in London. Um, uh, in, in October 2016, we've now got, um, you know, this, the, the pace has been extremely rapid of the evolution of this community, and it's, it's essentially it's become a reality. And that's thanks not to a small extent to the funders who've supported diverse kinds of projects, so the Trans Zuckerberg Initiative, you've heard in detail about the DCP, and also about some of the pilot projects that have been funded um, that are summarized here, and on the website you can see that these pilots encompass many different tissues and, and across uh, diverse parts, uh, many different organs. And then also the NIH for three different projects or three different initiatives that, that are sister initiatives and allied to the Human Cell Atlas to us, the HubMap, the Brain Initiative, and the Cancer Moonshot. And then also many other uh, funders, of course, the Welcome, who's, who's been with us from the beginning, and also Kavli for funding meetings and, um, and a, a brain development uh, a pilot infrastructure. Um, the Helmsley Foundation, um, the, the, the fantastic people who've organized um, the meeting, um, and there are also funders, the, the FET, who's interested in, in um, potentially uh, funding research allied to HCA, and then other submitted applications and supported projects in those foundations um, that are linked. And so with that, uh, uh, no, so last but not least, um, coming back to the registry, this is really um, a very important step, I think, for the Human Cell Atlas that we've, you know, it, it was um, Stan and Arnold who really suggested we need to keep track of the projects and the participants in the institutes. And as you can see, this is, this spans, we span 44 countries, um, close to, to 500 scientists at this point, and 341 institutes. So this is a truly global effort. You can look at the breakdown here, um, and, and the, 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 the institutes per country, um, 
the, the, the evolution of registrants over time. We should, so we, you should see that there's a peak at the launch, and so we hope that there will be another peak after this meeting. So please go to the humancellos.org slash, slash join HCA and, and do register if you haven't already. And um, of course, you can register as a, as a member. You can also register as a project. You can see there was another peak where the DCP folks all joined as a project, as their, their projects. And then you can also see the breakdown in terms of the projects per organ on the right-hand side. And um, you know, unsurprisingly, there are, there are 11 projects for the brain and nervous system. The immune system encompasses a lot. Um, but there's really a, a, a really nice distribution across many of those um, areas that we prioritized in the white paper, and, and in, indeed many more in addition. So that's, that's fantastic. And this is a way for people to uh, link to each other and, and to coordinate the community. So please go to humancells.org slash join HCA. Finally, um, what's, there's been a tremendous enthusiasm and curiosity from the public. Um, this is a, a picture of the crowd in the Science Museum when Ma Mike Stubbington gave a talk about the human cells and used the analogy to Lego, the, the pirate uh, Lego and the, 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 the pieces of Lego being the cells. And I also want to mention at this point that there are journalists here from, from the BBC and, and potentially other venues. And it's been absolutely fantastic, the, the interest and the, um, the way this has captured the imagination of the public, this can, the way we have basically done that. I think that's, that's uh, just amazing. Okay, and I will finish here. This is a pictorial representation of the project registry and the, the participant registry. Here you can see again, um, I mentioned the, the brain and nervous system and, and, and the immune system, but, but you can also see there's really a, a fantastic diversity of um, interest going from uh, developmental tissues through to all the different adult tissues and, and, and um, including certain pediatric tissues and then the cancer. And with that, basically I will wrap up and we can move on to the talks. Yes. Thank you, Thank you everyone.